All right, so we'll call the meeting to order. The first item on the agenda is declarations of interest. None? Okay, and next is approval of minutes. Carried. And then we go to our one and only item on the agenda, but with an exciting slide presentation. Information Technology Services 2018 Work Plan. We're skipping the traditional state of the city address for the IT subcommittee because all it would say is there were no dancing bananas and all the computers work. Thank you, Chair, and committee members for allowing us to share details around several exciting 2018 initiatives. Um, the presentation has been broken down by branch, and the format that I'm looking to follow is to uh, put a pause at the end of every branch section for any questions that you may have for one of my colleagues. Uh, given that the, we have a number of slides, it would be good to uh, get your questions answered throughout the slide deck. Thanks. Just waiting, councillors, for the projectors to get warmed up. Okay. Thank you. So, before we talk about the operational initiatives, I wanted to begin by setting the planning context in terms of how are we planning our 2018 work plan. And as you can appreciate, there are many ways in which you can come up with different multi-operational planning frameworks. And last summer, we looked at uh, some of the globally recognized you know, firms, specifically the ones that had a bit of a technology focus, and to find out uh, what type of planning frameworks do they use to manage their IT plans. And the one thing that we found in common was uh, this uh, very simple framework called Objectives and Key Results, uh, which is known as OKRs. Uh, to give you an idea of uh, uh, some of the organizations that are, uh, um, um, okay. uh, some of the organizations that are uh, following OKRs uh, as part of their work planning frameworks, uh, you can see some of the names there. And you'll appreciate that the choice of planning framework also dictates what type of work culture you are helping drive in your organization. And uh, the message that we wanted to share with you was uh, that we want to be uh, standing out as an IT shop uh, that thinks and behaves like the highly competitive external technology market out there. So that's the kind of a vision we have. Um, very briefly in terms of how does OKR work, um, you have a number of objectives at the service level. Each one of those objectives have some key results. Each one of those key results becomes the objective of the branch underneath it. So the more, um, the more further you go within the organization, the more granular and the more time bound those objectives are going to become. Uh, and these objectives have one thing in common, they're ambitious, they're measurable and they're time bound. And we have selected a number of them throughout the slide deck that we want to show you, uh, beginning with Network Operations Branch. I'm joined here by my colleague Matt Granier, who leads that branch, and he will share with you some of those OKRs within the branch. Morning, Councillors. I'm going to go over five things this morning. Uh, the first one is uh, server virtualization. Uh, this was a question that was asked uh, in the last IT subcommittee, so we'll give an update on that. Uh, the current landscape uh, that we have is uh, we have 1,116 servers, um, and of those, 84% are virtualized. Um, there's 177 physical servers that remain, and of those, approximately 9% of them will, will also be uh, you know, on track within the next year or two to become virtualized as well. Uh, nine more, so we'll get up to about 93% virtualized. Yeah. Um, every, uh, what a virtual server is essentially is a, a group of um, resources uh, in a host that are uh, consumed 
uh, to create a, a virtual server instead of a physical, which is more expensive. So the, the virtual, virtualized environment is actually a more affordable and easier to manage solution. Uh, some of the considerations we have when we're trying to get physical servers to virtual are uh, hardware limitations, uh, security concerns, and there's obviously legacy software and, and solutions that are not supported in a virtual environment. Uh, and then we also need to, you know, uh, get the business lines uh, on board to, to replace some of these solutions, and that can take time and there's budget pressures and that kind of thing. Um, our future plans to address this are through uh, client education and partnership, um, re-architecting some of the existing solutions to work in a virtual environment. Uh, there's obviously the life cycle of applications to the cloud uh, or from a physical server to a virtual server. Um, and then there's also some applications that we will have to wait until they retire um, in order to wait to get a virtualized or supported system. The next thing I'm going to talk about is a uh, Windows Server upgrade. So the uh, operating system that's running on uh, the majority of our servers today is uh, Windows Server 2008. By, by 2020, that's, that uh, will become end of life. And that means that we have to replace all those all those server operating systems by the end of 2020. Uh, right now, we've already upgraded about 50% of those servers, and we have a, a long way to go over the next two years to replace the rest. Uh, some of the considerations for the Windows server operating system are legacy applications, uh, business, obviously the availability for the business to partner with us and test applications, uh, and the, one of the most complex pieces is scheduling the upgrades of the servers around different different uh, times of the year that can impact the business. We have to be mindful of that. Uh, our future plans to address this, um, we're, we're looking to test applications as early as possible with business partners, uh, and we, we need to get agreement uh, and a, a set schedule for the outage for each server upgrade, and as well as we want to explore hybrid IT uh, virtualization options like cloud and on-prem and co-location. The next thing I wanted to talk about was automation. So uh, many, many tasks um, that we have today can be, uh, can be automated further um, and, and uh, enable better productivity and uh, enable IT staff to focus on business projects and newer initiatives that are more important. Uh, so that's something that we're focused on. Um, we also have, a, have monitoring solutions that we're going to be implementing uh, that we've mentioned previously, um, and that's to uh, automate some of the manual effort that, that staff are doing today to create capacity so that they can also focus on other business initiatives. Uh, some of the considerations around this are security, hardware, and software limitations, um, and essentially reviewing the manual practices of today and sort of challenging the status quo or why we're doing things a certain way and then looking to automate that, those uh, activities. So our future plans are collaborating with other, other units uh, or branches within ITS, um, acquisition of that monitoring solution that I mentioned, and then some, some adoption of uh, more agile operational practices. Uh, the next one I want to talk about is Citrix NetScaler. This, this actually is the remote access solution. Uh, so this is what, what vendors use and, and clients, or sorry, business, business staff when they're at home, they use to connect into the city resources. Um, the solution we have today is coming end of life, and we're replacing that with Citrix NetScaler uh, as re our remote access solution. Um, the new solution is already well under development, and it's in pilot right now. Uh, so we're, we're sort of on track with that. Uh, some of the considerations are heightened security requirements. As, as a result of the audit, there's some certain checks and balances we have to put in place for that. And then there's, there's some technical training for our staff so we can maintain the system. And uh, mig migrating the, the existing business lines to, to utilize the new solution versus the old one, moving vendors over, and all those things. Um, some of the future plans to address are um, education for business users and, and vendors and implementing uh, the heightened security for remote access. And the last one I'm going to talk about is uh, the data center. The, uh, so we have the two primary data centers, obviously 110 Laurier and 100 Constellation. Um, in those data centers, we have aging infrastructure, so there's a lot of technology in there that needs to be life-cycled, and we are, uh, that is planned in our work plan, we're going to be working on those things. Uh, some of the considerations around the data center are security, um, there's legacy applications which prevent us from moving uh, certain, 
servers and uh, different applications around the city. Uh, and then there's obviously client buy-in to replace or to uh, co-locate or move to the cloud any solutions. So our future plans to, to address the aging infrastructure are hybrid IT opportunities that I mentioned previously, so cloud co-location and on-premise at 100 Constellation data center. Uh, and then there's, we're, this year we're looking at doing a cloud readiness assessment to determine what solutions in the DC1 or 110 Laureate data center can be moved to the cloud. And then we have a, a data center inventory and mapping that we want to do of, of the 110 Laureate data center in order to understand what can be moved to DC4 cloud or uh, co-location. And uh, that's it. Uh, Councillors, if I can just add uh, one more point on this one. This is a, a challenge that many municipalities, all of them are grappling with, which is how to fund uh, this, uh, this, this migration to the cloud. Because uh, at this point in time, you know, when we need servers, we go use capital dollars and we purchase that equipment, and then we use that equipment for as long as we can. Uh, versus the cloud model, of course, is a monthly lease model in which you have to you know, budget a certain amount of money perpetually uh, to pay for that service, whether it's a, a hardware that you're trying to lease off the cloud or whether it's an application that you're wanting to put. And that is a, something that, like I said, not just the city of Ottawa, but all municipalities are looking to, uh, to figure out how are we going to solve that issue. Uh, with that, councillors, uh, Mr. Chair, if there are any questions for my colleague Matt on any of the content he has provided. Thanks, Matt. Uh, one quick question. I'm curious when you talk about uh, the automation of manual processes, what sort of processes are different departments asking you to automate? Can you give us a flavor for that? Yeah, so this is internal in ITS that, that I'm talking about for automation. Okay. And it's really about creating capacity to work on projects and free resources to work on business projects. So the demands that the business are, are, uh, are put, like asking IT, of IT. Um, but I, I do have an example um, of what I mean by automation. So um, a, a recent example is that one, one of our, uh, two of our team members worked together to automate a, a, a process that previously had people driving to buildings and manually getting in cars and driving and doing mileage and that kind of thing and, and automating it so that the configurations are all done remotely from 100 Constellation. So there's no, no longer a need to drive, uh, drive around or, or do any of that. Yeah. Uh, Councillor, another example would be is that, as you know, we have to apply patches to all of the various systems that we have for security purposes. And uh, patch management process can be a very manual one, can be very heavily you know, laborious. And that is something that are lots of good solutions out there that can help us automate a lot of the patch management work as well. And that's another thing that we are working as well on this year would putting more of our applications and services in the cloud save us some significant time on that patch management? Yeah, there, there, it, it can save time having it in the cloud. Um, it tends to be more expensive uh, depending on what solution you run. So we could, if we're using a let's say a platform as a service or a software as a service model, then that could end up be having automated patching and things happening behind the scenes and save us some time. If we're using an infrastructure as a service model for cloud, then that, could, that would end up us doing, still having to do a lot of that work. And if I can just add a little bit more light to that. So infrastructure as a service is basically all you're doing is really there's somebody else who's hosting your hardware, but you're still uh, responsible for managing everything related to the hardware versus software as a solution or a platform as a solution, you're offloading a lot of your own management work over to the third party. Of course, both of them come with a very different costing model. Okay. You're saying that the difference in costing is between operating costs and capital costs, I take it from what you're saying. But is the overall, is there's two aspects to that. Is the overall a better economic base in total? And secondly, is it also a much better efficiency in operational, which will save in other operations? Because does one sort of half offset the other? Okay, that's a good question. The, it, it really depends on the solution you're using. So, so we'd have to individually evaluate each solution to determine whether it's better to go into the cloud, you'll save money, or it'll be easier to manage. Um, and the idea behind it is that you're, 
depending on how data is used, if you're pulling down data from the cloud often, then you get charged for that. So there's, there's certain solutions that, are, that fit better in the cloud and other ones that may work better on premise. Um, also, counselor, depends on high availability. If you're looking for something to never go down because it is business critical, that would be a very big deciding factor as well in terms of where you want to host it. Yeah. And also, well, we don't want to have, when we've seen fiascos with things like payrolls and various things in other organizations, this can happen in any kind of data, I understand. So uh, is that the, the overlayer that you're looking at about doing it carefully so that you test things very well before you actually put them into real use? Uh, absolutely, Counselor, and the idea is to do it in, in pilot phases. So we are looking to test various services using the cloud service providers in Canada. And, you know, there are a couple of big names that have opened up data centers in Canada that we are uh, working towards. And the idea is to do small-scale pilots to see what the appetite is, what are the learnings associated with that migration, and then scale it to, uh, to for wholesale applications. Yeah. Are you aware of the new data center in, in the Canada North Business Park? I, I ran into it. Oh, no, I didn't run into it. I ran into somebody who was, was dealing with it. It's only a year or two old. Uh, Councillor, I am familiar with the, uh, the local data center uh, that has opened up, and there are actually uh, a number of those types of localized data centers, not just in Ottawa, but spread all over the country. Um, one of the things, one of the deciding factor in terms of which cloud service provider you go to uh, is, is also, uh, you know, what type of other software applications are available that support that particular cloud service provider. So. You know, if you go to one of the big ones like AWS, which is Amazon or the Microsoft one, uh, they will have a marketplace which will have, you know, hundreds and hundreds of apps, you yeah. know, and you are able to then uh, integrate some of those with your systems to create more benefits for the business. Uh, it, it will depend on solution by solution, as my colleague Matt mentioned. There may be certain solutions that would be completely okay with using a localized data center. And I've also heard that if things go through the state, sometimes that is a security issue from privacy for individuals. Is that something that you're taking into consideration? Uh, absolutely, Councillor. And we have a data classification scheme that we are, are following. And uh, data can be divided into, you know, various categories. The, of course, the highly classified one where we don't want data to... Uh, you know, go to um, um, any particular, you know, country where we may not be able to get it back or it may be stolen. You know, those are all the considerations. Again, depends on which solution you're talking about. There may be certain solutions where it will make no sense to put them on the cloud. It will make sense to keep them on premise. Okay. Finally, if this is all going to have obviously some budget implications, and you might run into some opposition at certain quarters to having an increased budget, but if we don't do that, we're going to have other problems within our operations. So have you got some sort of strategy of how we're going to look at what the costs are and how we can implement them? Because I think we are going to need additional budgets, and that means uh, possibly reducing other budgets or uh, having an increase. It's just I don't think there's any choice, really. Uh, Councillor, we are quite confident that with the money that we have, that we had last year, and with the bump that we got in 2018, and that we have quite sufficient funds to... Uh, do that piloting of all the applications using cloud service providers. And then when the time comes for a application itself to permanently leave our premise over to a cloud, uh, we work very closely with our business clients uh, to make sure that they make it part of their budget in, in terms of the cost that would be associated so the with the money. spread out in the different departments as opposed to all in one place. That's right. Okay, thank you. Councillors, we are now going to uh, move to Frontline Services Branch, and I'm going to be joined by my colleague Lee Farrell. Uh, a couple of you may have met him just recently when he was at your offices to, with, a, with a briefcase of sort with a webcasting toolkit that he was showing off. And I think he would love to, uh, after this meeting ends, if he wanted to you know, look in and, and feel the, uh, the webcasting toolkit that he has, he'd be happy to show it. But with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lee. Um, yes, good morning. It was a very heavy briefcase as well. Um, so I'm going to provide an overview of our current service delivery and highlight some items that we have coming soon. Um, so as you may know, uh, our team is the first point of contact for support for nearly all technology used by City of Ottawa staff and elected officials. 
We provide support for all desktop applications and software, computer hardware, including over 10,000 desktops and laptops, and an expanding set of mobile devices, um, uh, over 4,000 in fact, uh, now including Samsung and uh, Apple products. Uh, we also provide on-site um, issue resolution for matters which not, cannot be resolved remotely at over 300 sites across the city of Ottawa. Uh, this on-site support includes uh, computer hardware software, uh, in-building technology uh, such as AV-enabled spaces, and telecommunications support for voice uh, uh, and data-related services, and, and much more. Uh, we provide this support through a combination of channels, including our online portal, uh, which continues to evolve and now includes a live agent chat option, which is growing in popularity. Uh, of course, we have our traditional phone support option, which is available 24 by 7, uh, and we handle about 40 to 50,000 uh, phone calls per year. Um, we have our two city uh, tech center walk-in support locations at uh, 100 Constellation Drive and here on third floor east at City Hall, uh, which is extremely popular and we're handling about uh, 8,000 to 10,000 uh, visits per year now at those, uh, at those sites. Um, we also have several special partnerships in place where frontline services staff are co-located with other city departments. Uh, for example, uh, we have frontline services staff embedded at 2465 Don Reed Drive with paramedic services, and they provide support for hundreds of uh, rugged devices that are used in, the, our, in our fleet of ambulances. Um, some different considerations that we're always uh, um, you know, mindful of, uh, you know, the rapidly changing needs of our clients. We're in, involved in more and more uh, engagements around mobile uh, solutions, uh, an expanding set of mobile devices, which I mentioned, um, keeping our staff skilled up and ready. So we're taking advantage of tools that we make use of regularly, including Pluralsight, uh, providing uh, you know, advanced training for Windows 10 and other technologies that are coming in the pipeline, and giving our staff opportunities to, um, to participate in pilots and gain experience with those tools before they get deployed to the, uh, the entire corporation. Uh, and of course, managing our capacity and avail availability is something that's just an ongoing activity in an operational group, trying to predict uh, seasonal spikes um, in, 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 in demand for our services, um, keeping on top of new projects and new, new technologies that are going to be launching so that we're ready when they, when they do come. Uh, some things that are coming in the, in the future, so uh, a mobile app we're going to be piloting uh, for our city smartphones in the second quarter of this year, which will allow uh, city, city staff to engage with IT for support and information right from their mobile device. Um, in, in, in related to that, um, we are also looking to launch a SMS request intake via text message from city phones for quick and easy uh, a way for staff to re request support from, from IT. Um, also, in Q2, we're going to be launching our mobile tech center, which is kind of a pop-up traveling version of our tech centers. So imagine, um, you know, there are sites in the, in the east end or the west end or rural where they might not have as easy access to the tech center here at City Hall or at 100 Constellation Drive. So we're going to be establishing a regular rotation uh, where we would have scheduled visits advertised in ahead, of, ahead of time so that uh, staff at those sites know that we're coming and that they know that we're able to um, to be on site and provide support to them. Um, next slide. I'll talk a little bit about collaboration tools and mobility. So Jabber uh, deployed to all network users. Um, of course, it includes many uh, features that are that are becoming uh, you know commonplace in a modern uh, office setting. So I think there's a lot of excitement around this, and we're seeing the adoption of it just continues to expand. It also integrates very well with our AV-enabled boardrooms, um, and uh, it allows for pretty seamless uh, uh, you know voice and video conferencing. Um, and uh, remote meetings uh, on our AV boardrooms. So we currently have about 33% of our 105 total boardrooms enabled with uh, modern AV equipment. We have 19 additional rooms that are in progress right, right now to be equipped with that same equipment and an additional 15 rooms following, following those. Um, webcasting kits. So we have seen increased demand for webcasting events both internally and externally. I've mentioned some of these in the past at a previous meeting um, and uh, we've now put together a mobile kit which we are piloting and I've already talked with with some of you I, I believe I've reached out to to all members of this committee uh, and uh, it's intended to be a, a grab and go easy to use kit that you would be able to take on on short notice uh, to to an event that you would like to you know broadcast to social media platform of your choice 
The kit has a mobile hotspot contained within it, so you can broadcast from, you know, from outdoors or from a rural site. So it gives you quite a bit of flexibility, and I'd be happy to show this to you and to talk more about it. Mobility. So it's been an exciting year on the mobile side. Of course, we've deployed our new smartphones, and now following on that, we have many opportunities, including one where we can refresh a lot of end-of-life technology that was deployed five, six years ago. There are a lot of, you know, fully ruggedized devices that were deployed in and around 2012 that are now coming to the end of their life. And at present, we have many new options that didn't exist back during that time, new cost-effective options using Samsung tablets and Apple devices that we're actively working with departments at exploring some of those options. Tethering options. This is something that there's been interest in. There is a tethering option we can offer you, which will enable you to turn your city smartphone into a mobile hotspot, so I'd be pleased to talk in more detail about that as well. And, of course, we continue to streamline a lot of our internal processes. We're trying to make use of our tech centers as best we can in as many ways as we can for deploying and supporting our mobile technology. For many of our employees, that's the most convenient option now is just to sort of gain support. Also, one last thing on mobility, mobile printing. So we are also looking to pilot a mobile printing solution in the second quarter of this year, which would allow you to print from your city smartphone from many of the most popular applications, including Mail, Chrome, Safari, and Office applications. Election support. So I'll just talk about a few things quickly here. So the Frontline Services team contributes in a number of ways to ensure that the activities leading up to, during, and after voting day are well thought out, coordinated, and supported in such a way that technology tools used within voting places and the election office are available and in good working order. We offer support to all voting places on advanced voting days. Voting day, we assist with standing up the election support team, staff, and call center by doing site assessments for voice, data, power, providing mobile devices, ensuring computing equipment is prepped and in good working order and well supported if something were to go wrong. In terms of a technology refresh, we do update and support the main election management system. And, of course, there are four web apps that support all these activities as well. The election worker application, where do I vote, am I on the voters list, and add my name to the voters list. Following election day, we will hold an event for elected officials and their staff to see the latest technology options for their office, which we believe will be fairly compelling at this time with Windows 10 on the horizon and all of the new options from Samsung and Apple. That's good? Okay. And, yeah, that's my update. Mr. Chair, Councillors, any questions for my colleague Lee? Councillor Baper. I think in the next term of council, we're likely to take a look at ranked choice balloting. Are you doing any work to get prepared for that? Councillors, my colleague behind me are nodding, not at this point in time. Okay, Councillor Wilkins. Thank you for the mobile device. We did try it out at my last week, and I had a problem not with that system, but with the camera, the video thing, which wouldn't work except in one plug, which meant we couldn't connect the other things properly. So I'm moving my location of meetings. But it was a nice, really nice system, and I think it's going to be very, very helpful. As I podcast quite a few meetings now, and it makes a difference. I do have people that comment on it. I got some complaints about the little break we had when we had to change cameras because people couldn't follow all of it. That's a good sign. But I think it's something that is going to be really very useful, and we may need a few longer connections and things because I think that would have helped, and just a few small things like that, and a backup battery. Because when we couldn't plug it in, the battery ran out. That was what the problem was in the end. So it is something I would suggest that you actually try. 
it's a very useful t tool to have and uh, I'm not sure you have the, the kit right now but it will be store it will be available at counselors lounge system pretty soon I think right now they can book it I actually booked a staff person too because they hadn't used it air before and I think it was useful to have them there they could see some of the things that we were having difficulty with particularly with people running it who are not tech people and that's what's going to be happening here because our staff people are mostly are not tech people so I just want to congratulate you on that and all the other things you're working on uh, I think would be extremely useful for the city um, thank you um, we will have uh, the kit um, here uh, following this meeting for anyone that would would like to to see it and um, also I just wanted to mention that following uh, following our, f our first pilot event we have um, added a few extra uh, components to the kit to try and mitigate against some of those unpredictable um, um, things that can happen when you get out onto a site that maybe you're not as familiar with um, but we'll continue to, to to get your feedback and enhance it okay thank you and uh, with no offense to the riveting webcast from uh, Councillor Leeper in the past, these are actually at much higher quality. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Drews. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm really happy to see the engagement and uh, actually the deployment of all the devices now with the city, with uh, Apple and Samsung. I ha and I'm really interested in uh, about tethering. You, we can take this offline if you want, but I like some more information on how you can do that on uh, city devices because, as you know, in our rural area, we have so many areas with no, we don't have uh, uh, the ability to have Wi-Fi everywhere. My other thing is uh, when we deploy the, our platform now on the city devices, if you, you cannot do screenshots on your emails, and I know this is probably security or IT setting. I'm not sure if there is a reason behind it because really you could kind of copy paste it from, and then you can do screenshot from your email, but it take you three steps instead of just be, be able to screenshot from your device, and it happened on all the Samsung devices. Uh, Councillor, on the tethering uh, question, we are going to be sharing um, a little communication piece with, uh, with everyone and we'll make sure that you have that information so you can get all of those details. Uh, on the screenshot from your device question, that is something that, uh, uh, Councillor, if it's okay, we can take it back and, and find out more about it and we'll update you. It, it's not a big issue you, because you could do it different ways, but I mean, you'll already be able to screenshot other things, so it's not really making... Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? No? Oh, so we're now going to move to the next branch, Applications Management, and I'm going to be joined by a couple of my colleagues, Jason Varney and Alison Gazer. Uh, good morning, Chair and uh, committee members. Uh, my name is Jason Barney. I'm the manager of applications. So I'm going to cover a few things. First thing I wanted to cover are the, the major upgrades and releases that we are planning to do this year. Um, one that you've heard already is around the Windows 10 and also Server 2016. So as a result of, of moving to this new desktop and new servers, it means we're actually having to go and test every one of the applications to make sure they continue to run and that they're compatible on the latest version. So that's, that's quite a large exercise that we're undergoing now to make sure that everything is continuing to be supported. There will be an outcome or several outcomes that happen with this, this exercise. We will find either applications run fine or we'll need to mitigate if there's any issues. So some of these include doing upgrades. So there will be a number of, we'll be doing dozens of upgrades on our, our existing applications to bring it to the latest version so that it runs on Windows 10 and server. Um, there are other mitigating factors we can do, things like putting them into uh, containers so we can use technology like ThinApp, Citrix, essentially allow it to isolate the application until such time as either there's, there's a, a fix for it, a replacement or upgrade that allow us to run that in the standard environment. Uh, we also have others where we're, we've already got a plan to do that replacement, so things are underway, so we will put them into that sort of temporary storage so that clients are not impacted, and then we'll move to, to doing a full replacement of that software. So again, this is a, a very large undertaking that we're currently doing. 
We're also doing something very similar due to Oracle database upgrades. So we're running that as well, which means we have to make sure everything is tested and compatible with the latest versions of Oracle databases, which again will require us to do upgrades to many of the applications. I want to cover, I won't go through the full list, but I just want to give you sort of a brief highlight of some of the applications we're either upgrading or replacing across departments. So within corporate services, one of the bigger ones is the Aquasys replacement, so that's water billing. So we'll be doing a release of that this year. Within city clerks, my colleague Lee also already mentioned, you know, we're doing upgrades on the elections applications. Within SIPD, we're doing a number of applications. We're also supporting the release of many applications to support the digital services strategy. That will be happening this year. Within planning, we are starting the land management solution. So that's a major upgrade, well, replacement of our current planning and permitting application. So that's starting now. Within rec, culture, and facilities, we are redoing the theaters website. So that's Shankman and Centerpoint. So we're going ahead with that. In EPS, Emergency and Protective Services, we will very shortly be releasing the open air fire permits. So that will allow you to apply for open air fire permits online. That will be coming very soon. With public works, we will be doing maximum mobility. So this is going to be providing the tools for field workers to work in the field with mobile devices to complete their tasks. So that will also be implemented this year. I'm now going to turn it over to my colleague, Allison Gazer, who's going to give you some highlights on what's happening in GIS. So most of our focus in 2018 was the rollout of business-specific web mapping applications. Those were rolled out now, actually, to a number of departments throughout. For example, we rolled out one with the sewer and wastewater team that allowed them to use the applications at their desktop or in the field with the city-issued smartphones that Lee Farrell spoke of. That allows them to inventory and confirm the inventory while in the field. The creation of that application actually reduced about 200 desktop installations. So that really helped the IT team to roll out. We've also rolled out one for the traffic services, which is a geo-notification application. It allows them to create occupant mailing labels for defined areas for things like traffic studies or parking restrictions. One of the key ones we've also worked on in conjunction with OC Transpo is an emergency responder application. It's a native offline web mapping application that allows emergency responders to arrive in the new light rail stations, do navigation, find process workflows. So we're going to have police, paramedics, fire, and the constables will be using that application with the rollout later this year. So for 2018, we're going to continue to try to expand our use of GIS and web mapping applications throughout the organization. We'll also begin a rollout of external facing applications, which will eventually replace our GeoOttawa. And one of the other big things we're working on is we're working with digital strategies team on the open data site. And finally, I just want to cover some of the new methodologies that we're going through with regards to DevOps and Agile. So as I'm sure you know, most people are very comfortable and familiar with having continuous improvements in technology that just happen all the time. That's what consumers are expecting. So for us to be able to meet those requirements, we're really looking at both DevOps and Agile. DevOps is really the merging of both the development team and the operations team into a single team. And it really has a lot of benefits. So this is really a cultural change as well as a technology change. So it involves automation and it involves putting those teams together and working in a very collaborative environment where they do releases in a much faster pace. So they'll go through and they'll automate the development. They'll automate the QA processes so that when we release something, it's tested to make sure that it functions as designed and it doesn't break our existing environment. So when we roll these things out, it's very challenging in the old world to go through and do these big regression tests to make sure you haven't broken anything. We're putting automated testing in place to make sure these things happen. As far as the deployments, they are also automated. So we can do these deployments quickly. We can do them real time. So this is the key around DevOps. 
tying into DevOps is agile. So if you think of the form of processes around, you know, sort of the traditional methods of software development, you would get requirements from business users. They may spend weeks and months developing these things and then handing it over to a development team who then interprets those requirements and then ultimately delivers a product that hopefully meets the requirements you were asked in the first place. When you talk about agile, we talk about bringing these teams together and they work in a very collaborative environment. So what they're doing is they're working with the business and the developers are working together and they're making these very quick, um, they'll, much shorter releases. So they'll, they'll provide key functions, they'll deploy them, and then they'll do value add functions on top of that. So it's all about being very flexible, course correcting very quickly. So you don't get somebody building something for months and coming back and saying, oh, that's not what you wanted. So this is, there's huge, huge value. And the key to this is obviously that we're doing many more deployments, which ties back to DevOps. So you can see that how the two go hand in hand. So I want to build on the success that we've had already with this. So in Ottawa.ca, working with the Service Ottawa team, so they're working very collaboratively with the web team, they actually released 31 releases on Ottawa.ca. So we're talking a release every week and a half on average. This is huge. This is, you, we would never have been able to do this in the past. So these cover things like uh, you know, fixes, operational uh, improvements, feature enhancements and new functions. And we did all of this with zero downtime to the clients. So I have this quote that actually, I didn't ask him to, to make this up for me for this purpose. I just asked one of our PMs who supports web services to say, how's it working? So I mean, he basically responded back to say, it's, it's outstanding. It's, you're, you're seeing things that we're building, testing, and automating and deploying way faster than we've ever been able to do before. So it's, it's been a huge, huge uh, improvement for us. So what do we want to do with this? So we want to build on the success we've had with the web team. In conjunction with this, we're, doing, uh, we're creating a DevOps Tiger team, which will use DevOps and Agile, and their focus will be on ra rapid prototyping and delivery of technology. We want to take those people out from the web team, from the Tiger team, and we want to develop champions. So these people are going to work with throughout IT, and they will be, we want to build this from the grassroots. We want to show the people who've shown the benefits of, of working in these environments to the other people within IT, so that they can, they can learn and build and will apply this across all of IT. We're also developing training, uh, so I will get into further details on plural site, but we have, we've developed these things called channels. So these are the people who are working in these environments and they've curated content to say, hey, anyone who's interested in DevOps, these are the things that we within IT have found very useful. These are the tools we're using, these are the methodologies we're using, and we're, we're making it available to, to all of IT to get to be built up to speed on, on key concepts and technology. Thank you, Jason. Chair, councillors, any questions? Feel free. Questions? Thank you. Just the time frame on the uh, open fire permit. Is it this year or? Uh? Sorry, when I say vary, the release is Thursday. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Wilkins. Just on the DevApps one, because I use that a lot, the sort of people in my community, I found it awkward because the new ones always come at the end. Can you not reverse that and have the new ones, the first ones that come on? Because then you're, you're searching. People often don't search by address. They, they come in, they look, what's the newest one? And, it, and they're not always exactly in that kind of order anyway. And anyway, that's just a small thing. The other thing that I find with them is that if you're searching by address, if I go into my ward and I say I want to know all the things on Maritime Way, of which I know there are a number, it gives me all sorts of stuff, not mostly Maritime Way. So there's this problem in that, that search for searching by a street. It gets me from uh, all over the city, and it's mostly not that street at all. So I mean, if you're working with fixing it, I, those, I know you're probably already aware of some of these problems. I don't know. They, they yeah, I am aware, Councillor, and actually I have great news for you. So the DevOps Tiger team, one of the things we're looking at as, as far as doing a refresh is for the DevOps. So we've been working with planning to, to come up with... Uh, functional enhancements, improvements, technology improvements. So this is this is actually one of the applications that we're targeting to do this DevOps rapid prototype and release. So that is currently on our radar. And I was happy when you left them on there, even when they've relapsed, because until they're actually built out, which can be several years, 
sometimes want to go back and check. We didn't use it to put them on. It just means there's an awful lot there now. Correct. Part of way through. So we also had, so the land management solution is a, is a long-term project. So we've been working with planning on how can we develop some more, we're calling them quick wins. So how do we work with planning to make sure that some of the things that we, you know, we don't want to wait for the, the eventual replacement of MAP. What can we do today? So there are a number of these initiatives that we're working with planning now to make improvements, including the DevOps. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Alison. Uh, Councillor Chair, we're going to now move on to uh, SAP. Oh, yeah, sorry, Councillor Weeper. Um, so on the uh, Geo Ottawa replacement was something that will work on mobile devices. What kind of time frame are we looking at for that? Um, so internally, the replacements have already begun. So for those people, Geo Ottawa can be used right now on city issues smartphones. Yep. Externally, uh, it will happen this year. Okay. Yeah. No, that'll be uh, that'll be good news. Um, and then in Dev Apps, uh, the ability to link directly to various different documents uh, is a, is a bit of a frustration for uh, community associations right now, trying to distribute planning rationales or or technical studies uh, on a one by one basis. Is that something we're looking at? So I'll bring that back to planning and make sure that they're aware of that issue. So we, we can certainly discuss it with them and see if that's something we can roll out. Okay. And the um, uh, in uh, sorry the the sire in our in our agenda e agenda uh, the ability to link directly to documents in there as well uh, particular agenda items. I'm not sure on that, but I will certainly follow up and see if that's something we can do. That would be hugely helpful. If I'm trying to point people to a particular report, uh, I'm, I'm pointing them to an agenda as opposed to the, uh, the particular PDF. So, yeah. okay, Councillor, okay. there is a solution replacement project taking place right now around SIRE. So uh, what we'll do is we'll make sure we get an up-to-date uh, status on that project and ensure that with this committee. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Chair? We're now going to uh, talk about SAP, and I'm going to be joined by my colleague Sandro Carlucci to talk about a couple of very exciting items that are happening in the world of SAP. Hello, my name is Sandro Carlucci. I'm the manager of SAP Solutions, and thank you very much for your time for me to provide an update on the SAP HANA upgrade, as well as our use of Fiori for our end users. Uh, in 2017, we made a decision that we were going to invest in the SAP HANA uh, platform. And I'd like to leave three messages of why we made this decision. It was a well thought out decision that we took into a number of different considerations. Firstly, we consulted with uh, various user groups and process owners. We have over 1,900 named users. We have 9,000 ESS uh, employee self-service that use it every day. So we wanted to ask them what were their plans? Where do they see themselves in three to five years with the SAP solution? We also consulted with other municipalities and public sectors that are similar to the size and the functionality that we use here at the City of Ottawa, just to see what were their plans with uh, this particular platform. Where do they see themselves as, so that we're not only the only ones in this community? We also reviewed the roadmap of SAP itself, and we found that um, going to the new HANA platform is where all the new innovations were that would help our clients here at the City. We also found that uh, going with HANA would improve some of our performances issues that we were experiencing. And we also felt that a lot of their investments of going forward with a lot of the Fiori solutions and other solutions that they are putting into place, they're moving with the HANA platform. So it was a clear, a clear conclusion that we make this investment in the product to upgrade it to give us these business benefits. The other message I want to provide to you is how we're making the change here at the city. Sa so talked a little bit about OKRs, right? One of our objective key results was to build this HANA upgrade. In previous upgrades that we used to do, we bring in uh, expertise, and that's the one thing is they're always very high in demand. And we bring them in, they would do an upgrade, they have all the knowledge, then they would leave, and then we'd be very dependent on these external individuals to come in and help us with our day-to-day -day support. We made a decision in 2017 that we were going to invest in our own talent. And as a, through training, uh, either self-taught or through some of the training courses that they've done, this is going to be a, a, a staff-led upgrade. And right now, uh, things are going well. We've already started our second of seventh builds of the platform, and we're aiming to go live by the end of the year in Q4 of 2018. And the third message that I wanted to provide is by going with the HANA upgrade, we're going to have the business potential that we are creating. This is a state-of-an-art platform. It can help us with our clients when they have analytical issues, 
when they're looking at upgrading some of their HR kind of uh, processes. A supply group is interested in upgrading some of their procurement processes. Finance is looking at changing some of their day-to-day -day process, either with the budgeting or month end, et cetera. And even a lot of our logistical areas, they're looking at how do we improve our day-to-day -day operations within SAP to improve it. And third, uh, second slide is with regards to Fiori. I want to share with you some of the successes that we've had in 2017 with using the new Fiori platform. In 2017, we rolled out 15 new Fiori tiles for our end users. We rolled out a new uh, work order management for our parks users, and so there are now 60 new users that use a new mobile solution. It eliminated a lot of the paperwork. It really gave the individuals the ability to see what they had to do, make the update, and enter in their time of the work that they've, con that they've done. We rolled out a new solution for our forestry users. They used to have two solutions. They had SAP, they had Cyclo. We replaced it with Fiori. It's easier for them. It's easier for us to support them. They have one solution that they're doing. And it's the same thing with regards to work orders, et cetera. We also have 3,900 employees that are submitting time through, through Fiori. Within the uh, Rec Culture Facility Services Department, they have 3,400 users and OPL in 2016 went live with the initial go live and they have about 500 users that currently enter their time using the Fiori solution. It's a very simplistic, it's one transaction, three clicks, very simple. And we're really excited as we move into 2018 that we're going to have some new users. We're rolling out a new inventory barcode solution that's going to be deployed in March of 2018 and we're excited that transit operations, fleet services, fire and paramedic services are going to be new users of, of our tool set. In addition, in 2018, we're going to be working with our finance group to see where can we have more future use of the Fiori solution. By doing the HANA upgrade, we're going to have access to 250 new tiles that we didn't have access to before. So this will allow us to use their solutions rather than trying to create our own. And so we're very excited as we move forward into 2018 with the upgrade working with our clients, and being in a good shape to deliver more solutions in 2019. Thank you. Thanks, Sandra. And one thing, Councillor, I, I wanted to add on this is we are planning to do a bit of a show and tell on what is Fury and, and demonstrate all the various apps that are already in place for people uh, who want to see how it actually works. And uh, we're hoping that some of you are going to be able to make it to that demo as well uh, sometimes in the next couple of months. Questions? No. So we'll be at the at the demo. Mr. Chair, we are now going to be joined by my colleague John Carter, and he's going to talk about uh, a very dull topic in IT, which is IT service management. And uh, John is going to make it really exciting for us, and he's going to talk very briefly about why is it important for the IT shop at the City of Ottawa to take service management to function. That's good because we thought the excitement was all behind us. Entertaining. Uh, so I'll start out um, this morning by describing a little bit about what IT service management is. So IT service management is best defined as a collection of activities that an organization performs to design, deliver, and operate IT services. IT service management is based on a best practice framework and it is characterized by adopting a process-based approach to delivering IT services and providing IT support functions. ITSM is very client-centric in nature, as its goal is to align IT services with the business needs of the client community. Last year, ITS did a current state assessment of our ITSM practices, and we developed an ITSM strategy which identified 45 initiatives that we want to carry out to improve our IT service delivery and our IT support functions. As a result of this, a new IT service management branch has been formed within ITS with the intent to carry out the documented strategy in 2018. I'd now like to highlight two of the examples of the initiatives that make up that strategy. The first one is the centralized management of technology assets. Most of our technology assets, the assets that we own and support within ITS, such as servers, databases, and applications, are managed and controlled in a centralized configuration management database, or CMDB. The CMDB is a module of our Marvell service management enterprise solution, 
However, we have other asset repositories that exist to manage other technology assets, which make it very difficult for us to report on the full picture of the assets that we own, their dependencies on one another, and their relationships with one another. So the goal of this initiative is to eliminate those other repositories, make the centralized CMDB the single source of truth for our asset data, and improve the processes that ITS staff follow to keep that data up to date. As a result, we'll have better control of our IT assets, and we'll have the ability to report on those assets quickly and accurately. The second example of initiatives that I'd like to highlight this morning is the CityTech portal improvements. The CityTech self-service self -service portal has become the primary ITS intake channel with over 75,000 client touch points in 2017 alone. Employees at this time can create new requests, check on the status of existing requests, or consume a number of self-service articles and videos via the CityTech self-service portal. However, forms do not exist for all of the services that ITS fulfills on the portal, and clients are unable to check and review on the devices and software licenses that they possess. As part of this initiative, we want to create a form to be able to have clients request any of the services that ITS provides and also give clients the facility to check on the devices and the software licenses that they possess and give them the facility to request and initiate a client device lifecycle through the portal if they're eligible and also to initiate a software license renewal if applicable. Thank you. Questions? No? Thanks a lot. Thank you, John. The next portion of our presentation is all about technology security. And uh, most of you have met with Chris Fulton. He is the manager of that branch. And he's going to take us through uh, a couple of initiatives happening in that area. Good morning, counselors. We're actively engaged in the following cybersecurity enhancements for 2018. Uh, this is to protect us from the ever-evolving threats uh, that are hitting us, to protect city information, which is the primary objective. Mobile management security control improvements are very important to us uh, with all the connected devices that are out there and uh, the remote access points. So we're currently engaged in optimizing the separation between work and personal space securing all new mobile applications that are now being installed on those uh, mobile platforms. We're also introducing stronger access controls with new technology like Citrix that we heard from both Matt and Jason earlier. And we're currently engaged in um, procuring a subject matter expert third party to review the security configurations to make sure we're, we're um, protected. Um, another one we're doing is penetration testing. Uh, we have just gone through procurement and we have a PO awarded uh, to a third party. Testing will begin on critical systems in April of this year. Remediation of those critical vulnerabilities that we find we're going to resolve within 30 days. At the same time, we're establishing a program uh, that we're going to do two of these external pen tests per year. System integration log sources. Um, we ha now have over 180 log sources feeding into our managed security service. This is important because, as we heard John mention earlier, a single source of truth. This is our single source of truth for all information relevant to security within the organization. Having all of that together in one place allows us to correlate, uh, look for vulnerabilities where we wouldn't with singular controls. We're also uh, going to be integrating the new endpoint detection response system we're putting in place and have those log sources also feed into, uh, into our central intelligence. Uh, we're also going to be doing an annual review of critical business systems to ensure that all are sending that relevant security information to the managed security service. With respect to the risk register, um, we've uh, implemented a risk register and we're now begun the process of populating that. The risk management processes are being finalized and uh, that will help us identify, track, remediate and review uh, risks. 
It will basically allow us to review the progress of mitigations and the continued relevance of some of the exceptions that we've had to grant to security controls. Endpoint Detection Response System, or commonly referred to as EDR, the security team have been trained to the advanced level for this particular tool that we put in place. The system has been implemented to all desktops and laptops within the city, and it's now being used to monitor for malicious signatures, which is a big step for us. It's to be uh, implemented to all servers by the end of the year. Policy and standards. These are a very important cornerstone to delivering a, a security program. Our technological, uh, our technical security standards have been approved in July of 2017, and the following uh, policies and plans have been just recently approved in February. Responsible computing policy, information technology risk management framework, the computer incident response plan, and uh, we're actually uh, going to be communicating all of this out to the organization, including our technology partners, uh, in March of this year. Other cybersecurity enhancements we're, we're looking into for 2018 are like I mentioned before, engaging our technology partners, those we consider to be all of our branches within IT, as well as OC Transpo, Traffic, Drinking Water, Wastewater, and Ottawa Public Library. We're going to be continuing the work of populating the risk register. Uh, we are going to, once we have the register populated, we're going to be creating dashboards from a technical and executive level. Uh, remote access, we're looking into multi-factor authentication. Privileged access, uh, privileged account management to better have uh, access controls into all of our critical systems. EDR, deployment for all of the servers, as I mentioned earlier. Update the information security policy, which is the last policy piece that we need to have updated. Increase proactive monitoring capabilities through automation and ensure regular patch management, which we heard from, from Matt earlier, we're working in collaboration with his team. And last of all, people modernization. Uh, we need to make sure that um, our people in the security team are relevant to the threats that are out there, are knowledgeable in the tools and the controls that we've put in place. And now I'll shift to talk about the managed security service. I was happy to hear that a number of you, I think all of you perhaps, had a, a tour of our managed security service. So I'm going to just quickly touch on a couple of key points. Uh, why do we have it? It's because keeping pace with the technology, we need help with that. We're a relatively small team, but uh, we've got tremendous amount of um, horsepower from managed security service to help us out in that respect. All business services are dependent upon IT and the Internet. Uh, we're seeing that more and more. Uh, sophistication and persistence of, you know, the threats that are hitting us from outside, as you'll see from one of the number slides that I've got coming up. And there's a heightened public awareness to cybersecurity. The what? It is a security service which can enable and innovate your business by integrating seamlessly into your existing security program. We have 7x24 security monitoring. We have incident management. We have threat intelligent detection analysis and management. But, however, it is not a replacement for your organization's existing security team as it does not have detailed knowledge of the inside of the city applications and business processes. The Ministry Security Service provider is CGI, selected in 2016. We're in a four to eight year arrangement with them. By far, it was the best fit for our city requirements, both financially and um, technically. It replaced THG, which is the Herjavac Group. Uh, we had that system in place since 2009. 
It is a global leader with 20 years of experience. It has a local Ottawa presence. It delivers services tailored to our needs and it's the world's fifth largest independent IT firm. There's 400 uh, offices uh, worldwide. They are driven by our satisfaction. We consider them to be a true partnership and uh, they have dedicated security resources. The current services, like I mentioned earlier, 24 by 7 SOC, um, a security operations center, monitoring and alerting, network antivirus, web content filtering, malicious illegal site prevention, uh, network intrusion prevention, and security logging and event correlation. Our experience to date has been effective triage and dispatch of security incidents to the right people with the right information and actions with improved detection, prevention, and response. High quality security relevant escalations with actionable intelligence and recommendations. Helping to reduce the complexity and the management overhead. We're realizing value through economies of scale and continuous improvements. The relationship is one of a true partner and is an extension of our security services. Currently, we are very satisfied with the level of service that we are getting from them as they are driven by client satisfaction and are committed to helping us succeed. So this demonstrates, uh, this particular diagram filter demonstrates the sheer horsepower the managed security service brings to us. We can see here in 2017, 73 billion log events were captured and processed. Almost 31 million malicious websites were blocked. And almost 13,000 detailed investigations were performed by that service and that all filtering down to 121 tickets for our internal security team to remediate in action. So there is a lot of stuff that's been going on behind the scenes with the managed security service. Thank you. All right, questions on this? No, I think we all asked the questions 10 days ago. Uh, Mr. Chair, for the next portion, we're going to talk about a number of things within the technology modernization branch. And one of my colleagues who leads this branch is unfortunately away on a short-term medical leave. So I'm going to try my best to cover a few of uh, her initiatives, and I'm going to be joined by my colleague Lee as well. Uh, the first one is software modernization, and my colleague Jason already talked about it a fair bit. Um, there is a, a list of all of the 180 applications and in terms of where they stand, are we investing them in them, are we migrating them, are we eliminating them. All of that information was shared uh, not too long ago with this committee uh, and we would be happy to provide another update on that list over the next month or so. Uh, but as you, can, uh, as you heard from Jason and as this slide demonstrates that there is no shortage of work when it comes to looking at our application portfolio. Uh, we have over 70 applications that we are going to be actioning on in 2018. Uh, many of them are being driven by the Windows 10 upgrade, uh, but at the same time there are some that are just so old, so legacy, they're dependent on some key resources within IT, uh, and we want to make sure that we remove that dependence as, as quickly as we can. So an update on Windows 10. Uh, so at present, we have uh, approximately 11,600 systems running Windows 7, uh, with many applications having a dependency on that version of Windows 7. Uh, currently, we have approximately uh, well, 100 plus Windows 10 systems being piloted within ITS, and we're using this as an opportunity to, to make adjustments to, our, to, to Windows 10 for our environment and for staff to, gain, uh, to become familiar and to gain experience in providing support um, for Windows 10. Uh, so some considerations, a key one right now being um, ensuring that endpoint encryption is ready uh, prior to the, the broader deployment uh, of Windows 10 within our environment. This is a focus at present. Uh, application and hardware compatibility is something that's uh, um, also a focus right now in ensuring that uh, we're able to you know, QA and make sure that critical business systems are able to run on the version of Windows 7, or sorry, Windows 10 that we'll be deploying. 
Um, also, we want to do this in, in, a, uh, in an efficient manner, and we want to optimize uh, the means by which we up upgrade uh, to Windows 10 by coordinating with our standard technology refresh that we do each year so that we don't need to go and you know, touch a system twice. Um, uh, plans to address in the future, so uh, the goal would be to uh, update all city computer systems uh, by uh, January of 2020. Um, I mentioned some of the security uh, considerations with encryption that are, that are a key, key element for us. Um, and of course, um, it's our goal to stay current with, with industry trends. Uh, we, we certainly want to, um, you know, uh, reflect the, the experience that many of our, our users uh, and clients have come to expect by using Windows 10 perhaps at home or, or in other parts of their, their life. And also, you know, considering that Windows 10 has surpassed Windows 7 at this point in terms of its global install base, so we certainly need to, to get uh, um, to complete that update. Thank you. Councillors, uh, the next one is about proof of concepts, and this idea is uh, very intuitive. Before you go out and make a big purchase, before you start writing an RFP uh, to buy a multi-million dollar application and you spend a couple of years through that process, uh, it makes sense to bring in some of those tools in-house and to test them on a very small scale. And so this is something that we started last year, uh, something that has really taken, uh, been taken up by, by IT staff and we want to continue this in 2018. Uh, there are a number of SaaS tools out there uh, that we are uh, looking at that are being presented to us sometimes when we uh, attend different uh, workshops. And we're bringing select few of them in-house. We're testing them on different functions within IT. So they could be around patch management, they could be around network monitoring, they could be around better management of on-call uh, on staff, um, uh, privileged access management. And there's a whole variety. And we know that these are areas where we need help. Uh, these are areas where we think that we are likely going to be going to the market in the future to buy those tools. And so we are testing them in-house. Um, we uh, have about uh, close to 10 POCs going on at this point in time. Uh, and we will continue to grow that number throughout 2018. The next topic is platforms. And uh, uh, one way to manage future fragmentation of technology footprint is to take a platform approach. Uh, and the idea is that you want to lump similar user requirements under one platform for providing you know, consistency, of, of service and consistency of user experience. And what you avoid by doing the platform approach is that you avoid um, not being able to rapidly scale uh, by not having good quality assurance practices. So there are several areas where such an approach can be taken, where we can lump similar type of uses under one platform. Uh, one of them would be API. You know, there is going to be a, quite a growth within the world of APIs. We want to manage those, those APIs under a single platform. The same thing can be said about enterprise file sharing. And as you heard uh, at, the, at our last meeting, we were talking about SharePoint as being that platform that we are deploying for file sharing. And the third one is, uh, is IoT. And uh, if you will recall, there was a presentation on this, uh, this, this topic was covered in one of the previous presentations where it is no secret that there is going to be, there is already, uh, uh, we are seeing a huge surge in sensor-based devices, each one of them having their own IP address. And IT will need to make sure that we are able to deploy them, we are able to manage them, make them talk to each other, protect them, replace them. Uh, and all of that, if we are going to do with, you know, 15 different applications, 15 different tools, uh, that is going to become quite cost prohibitive. It's going to become, you know, operationally wise, very, very difficult. And so that is an area which is ripe for a platform approach. And so this year, the goal is to, uh, to gather all of the user requirements related to IoT, and then, again, do a couple of proof, uh, proof of concepts before we go out in the marketplace to procure such a platform. Any questions on this, committee members? All right. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. The next topic is MS Project Online. My colleague Heather Gerard is going to give a quick status update. Good morning, Chair and committee members. One of the key objectives 
that is being led out of the Technology Project Management Group is the Microsoft Project Online Solution Implementation. This is a cloud-based solution offering and it is a project work management tool that enables resources leading and managing projects to effectively um, uh, have a repository and a tool that they can use to manage those projects. So back in 2017, we conducted an assessment to determine the current tool that we're using right now, which is CAPPM, why there really wasn't a large adoption across the organization. And one of the, two of the key elements that came back out of that survey was the tool, um, the complexity of the tool. It wasn't simple enough and it was cost prohibitive. So we listened to the community and us as well. We found that there was some benefit if we moved away from that tool and introduced another tool, which was Project Online. So some of the key outcomes that we're really going to see from this tool is um, enabled better decision making. So we're going to get all that project data into the tool. We're going to get it centrally stored. We're going to have visibility and transparency of all the information. Everybody will get a true sense as to where things are, what the issues are, and what the risks are. It's going to enable us to modernize our practices. So it's going to be able to introduce and provide the capabilities for agile project management. It's going to allow us to enable some efficiencies and some automation. We can get this tool configured to get workflows and uh, reduction of work. There's a lot of manual work in the practice right now. So we'll get that tool to enable all of those benefits. So at this point in time, where we are is we have completed a phase one rollout. So the phase one was focused on ITS. So we're looking to get ITS off that current tool and migrate it onto the new tool. So we've accomplished that. And we're now using the tool as our new central repository. We've enabled project reporting. We're going to get all that information rolled up nicely so we have a dashboard on this, how our portfolio is performing. And uh, we've enabled time management as well. So this first release really is about baby steps. We're, learning, we're figuring out how to crawl right now in this tool so we can get to that place to get all those benefits and the outcomes. As part of this, the end, the last couple of months, we've also been working on raising the awareness across the organization, reaching out to all those project management offices to introduce the tool and give them demonstration. There has been an expression of interest from some of these groups, and we're working with the um, Service Innovation and Performance um, Department, their project management office. They're, they're working on conducting a pilot to assess the tool and see how it needs to be configured for them. We're working with Ottawa Public Health IT Business Partner to assess whether or not that can meet all of their business tools for their project type of work, and also the Planning Infrastructure and Economic Development Group as well. Any questions? Uh, Councillor Reaper. Can you just tell me a bit more about that, um, about the tool? It, this is an off-the-shelf solution. It's not something we're, we're building from scratch, I assume? Yes, Councillor, this is the off-the-shelf solution. Of course, when it comes into our environment, we have to do some level of customization, uh, which is the reason why we are spending a little bit of time to make sure that customization is done correctly. Uh, but uh, the actual tool itself is a tool that anybody can go to the Microsoft uh, website and, and purchase. And is the, the intention to try to have people working within that so that they're not working with, you know, any number of, of consumer available, freely available tools? Our goal, Councillor, is that we want to offer uh, a couple of options for the user community within the City of Ottawa. There are certain functions within the City where it does warrant to bring in a heavy-duty project management tool such as the one that we are actually replacing. And so we will continue to make sure that we offer that for those select clients and offer the technical support associated with it as well. Uh, but for most projects, for most projects that happen within the city of Ottawa, uh, we, we are confident that uh, users are going to like what they see and we will be able to roll this out to them as well. Okay. Thanks. Councillor Tierney. Great. Um, well, thank you for that presentation. And I, I think I've made it clear in the past uh, out of this uh, exciting presentation of slides today, this is the one that's actually going to save the taxpayers the most money at the end of the day. I firmly believe that. 
uh, the end of version spreadsheets on desktops controlling multi-million dollar projects I'm hoping will be part of history very soon, um, as well as the workflow aspect of SharePoint and what it brings to the table, uh, being such a big corporation. So it was more, I didn't have a question, I just wanted to throw that out there and say I'm very excited. Uh, if you need the guinea pig, I'm always there, and uh, good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Councillors, we're fast approaching the end of our slide deck. And uh, the last uh, colleague of mine who's going to join us is, uh, is Bev Gibbs, and she uh, manages a small team uh, of technology solutions, and she's going to talk about a couple of items under her portfolio. Okay, thank you. So with technology ever-changing and with more than 55 major service areas at the city, we are constantly receiving quests for new, requests for new IT solutions. So one of our things that we wanted to focus on in technology solutions is to make the intake and the receiving of those asks as swift and efficient as possible. Last year, we implemented a more nimble intake process. Uh, previous to that, the decisions had generally been made by internal staff committee. What we did was we implemented a process that you can see just the very high level, high level workflow on your slide that quickly established if an ask was large or small and applied the appropriate level of rigor based on that answer. Uh, we saw many successes uh, with this already, uh, with the full year behind us of doing it this way. Uh, we saw synergies um, become obvious between different departments. Um, a good example of that would be one uh, area coming to ask for a replacement of their contents, uh, contact sector, center technology, pardon me, contact center technology, and we quickly realized that there were a few others that needed something similar. We were able to bring them all on the same page and uh, into the same meetings and look at what uh, the industry would offer and, uh, and basically have a consensus uh, decision made on which uh, solution would be best apply in that case. So that was one of the uh, many successes. We also had the whole SharePoint and OneDrive for Business uh, conversation happen amongst 19 different groups. So we were able to conduct that kind of conversation while moving things forward to identify a solution that would meet everyone's needs. Uh, another way that this has been um, demonstrating its value was the ability to coordinate resources in IT for very complex uh, initiatives. An example of that would be the digital strategy, digital services strategy projects of which there are 10 plus or so. Um, we were able to coordinate the resources that would be needed and make sure that we're proactive and that they're ready to go and scheduled. Last year we had something uh, around 318 new items come through us, our, our small group of 12. Uh, 260 of them we moved through very quickly. Uh, close them out or move them into a project state and they've been completed. There are a few that are still open and in progress and then um, a few of those were considered large projects. Uh, things like the SAP roadmap which needed a little bit more rigor and therefore governing decision up at the senior level. This year, just to um, link back with my uh, colleague who is just up here, Heather, um, our next step for the intake will be to really integrate it in the Microsoft Project Online solution so it's seamless from our internal perspective. So as with everything, um, we are continuing to try to get ahead of the asks of technology, which can often be a challenge. So our focus in technology solutions for 2018 is to work with all of the departments at the city to come up with a roadmap um, to better plan where they're taking their business in the future and therefore what kind of technology solutions they will need and when. It could be replacement, it could be upgrade, it could be net new, it could be any of those things. We want to give consideration to um, some of the key things uh, that would be disruptive in technology. Um, we want to give consideration to innovations that we see in our day to day here in IT. Of course, we need to plan for any legislation that may be coming down the pipes from the province and beyond. Uh, and then, of course, just general internal external demand for certain things that we hear about. We know that we can start planning for it. Uh, so we have initiated um, conversations with um, many of the departments. We're planning to do a one to three year roadmap. Uh, since technology is constantly changing, we don't want to go too far out. Uh, and the plan is that it's dynamic. Uh, we do a check in with our departments uh, annually on that in advance of the budget process so that we can say, okay, we said we needed to do this. Let's just make sure we're still doing it. 
and that you have that ready from a resource perspective. Uh, and then, of course, we're going to be bringing together all of the things that you heard today as inputs. Obviously, the software modernization list, our asset list and the, that John Carter was speaking about in um, the IT service management, um, uh, licenses, contract renewal, everything. It's, it's complicated, but we want to bring it all together um, in a very kind of uh, consumable manner so that it turns into an annual actionable work plan for each of the departments and IT together. Thank you, Bev. And uh, the last slide here is uh, uh, perhaps the one that I take the most seriously in my day to day, which is uh, all about learning. It's a top priority for the management team. And uh, what you'll find is that in typical IT shops, most of the focus, most of the discussions are let's buy a tool, let's buy a platform. And most of the effort is around that. In, in some of the uh, IT shops, you'll also find that they're saying, in addition to the tools, let's also talk about our business processes. But in most IT shops, what you'll find is that they're paying lip service in terms of the, the training or the learning that's involved. And by, by, by not investing in the training and learning of IT staff in any shop, what you're really doing is you're creating a people liability. Um, so this has been a, a something that we are extremely proud of. In fact, uh, based on all the discussions that I regularly have with my peers, I would not hesitate to say that we are probably uh, leading, if not the leader, when it comes to how a municipality in North America is providing learning opportunities to its technical staff. There's a platform that we invested in which is called Site. And it's the same platform that Amazon and Google and Microsoft and those IT folks have access to. So our city of Ottawa uh, IT services is, is, is uh, able to, to use that same content. Uh, and just looking at the numbers, as you can see that in the last year, uh, we were able to deploy some you know, 3,500 worth hours of top quality training to our IT staff. Um, you know, the training is so popular that, and it's unlimited, it's like a Netflix of training, so you can, you know, with, with a small subscription, you can consume as much as you want, and we're finding that some of our staff are so excited about the opportunity that they're doing it on their own time after hours over the weekends, and uh, this is something that we want to continue uh, for the rest of 2018, uh, simply because all of the things that are in the pipeline, uh, are the things that if we don't train our staff on, that we will be dependent on external consultants. Uh, with that, Mr. Chair, this is the end of our, our presentation. Any other questions? Are there any other questions? I suspect not. I just have one. Okay, Councillor Tierney. I'll keep it brief, uh, Mr. Chair. When did you um, take over this shop, Said? Uh, July 5th, 2016. So I want to thank you because I've noticed, and I had 15 years of IT experience, I've worked on many different teams doing, oddly enough, SAP implementations back in the day, uh, enterprise architecture, and, and a whole bunch of other things. And having the team all rowing in the same direction is a critical component. And I can say honestly, and Nan used to chair IT uh, back in the day as well, uh, it, we've always had this challenge of seeing a complete team all rowing in the same direction. And I can honestly say this is the first time I've seen it is in the last couple of years. So thank you for your leadership and thanks for the team uh, working together the way that they do. Okay. Yeah, I just uh, remarked that in the last two years uh, I, I've seen a huge transformation here. And I never thought we would have this much confidence in what we're doing going forward. But uh, you guys have done a great job. And uh, I think it's going to be a lot better, especially uh, facing the challenges we heard about 10 days ago. Okay. So on, oh, Councillor DeRoos. Uh, thanks, Chair. I just, uh, I want to echo what uh, uh, the Chair and Councillor Tony said. Uh, when I join, when I actually become an elected official and I sit on this committee, I reviewed a lot of soft stuff that, and lots of application. And working with the new group, and uh, in the last two years, I have to say the things are changing, and I could uh, I could understand, I could see the vision and where we're going. Because honestly, I had an anxiety before and after, and I'm not saying uh, uh, IT is uh, it's very a pillar in our city because we deliver services day in and day out, but it's invisible. Not too many people see it. It's not like you're paving roads and people could see the pavement. This is actually more critical, and yet. 
uh, we were really lacking on some of the aspects. We had so many software that we were not using and they're not compatible, they're not talking to each other through my background and my technology background. I, I see that uh, we have a better future brighter and you guys focusing on a good direction. This is, I just want to add my congratulation to you and your team for this collaboration and working into this very difficult time in our uh, technology days. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wilkinson. Yeah, I can echo the thing about the organization. I've seen an enormous change. Just a couple of things. We used to have a problem that departments would come in and ask for a particular software package they saw on things. Are you now saying no to them and uh, just trying to find out what they really need and then going around it that way rather than just saying okay? Because that was a problem we were having in the past. Uh, Councillor, no is a word that we try to seldom use. Uh, we want to be as flexible as possible uh, with all the constraints that we may have around us. Um, yes, we are seeing less and less of that simply because we are now handling the entire city of Ottawa as, a, as an account. And we have, you know, segregated the various business lines into key accounts. And we're providing, you know, the same kind of approach that a private sector would offer to their various clients. And we are trying to be a bit more proactive in terms of what their needs are so that they don't feel that they're not being listened to by IT. We're making our processes really simple that they don't get stuck in IT. And so because of that, we're seeing less and less of clients going out on their own to buy those software products. That's good. I think the issue always was that if they let you know what they need, that you can usually find a better solution. Maybe it's the one they want, but more, most of the time I think it wasn't. The other thing is, is in looking forward to the future, we, we all know that AI and autonomous vehicles and robots and all the other things that go with it are coming down really, really fast. Uh, how are you sort of preparing yourself so how you can deal with that? I know you're involved with the, center, the committee of all the different departments working on, on smart cities and going ahead, but IT is going to play a really important role in all of that, I think, and uh, just was wondering how we're getting prepared for it, because I think there's an awful lot of discussion about the fact that we know it's coming, but people aren't getting ready. and. And getting ready is so important. Uh, Councillor, uh, it's not just IT who's handling all of those new disruptive innovations coming towards us. Uh, we are working in, in strong partnership, daily basis, with uh, my colleague on the SIPD side, Mark Rene, uh, with his Digital Service Transformation Initiative, and with Economic Development Partners as well. Um, you know, for my own IT team, uh, the, the best thing that we can do at this point in time is to get as much of our back-end infrastructure as possible uh, to a level where it can start supporting things in AI, things in IoT, things in autonomous vehicles. Uh, and that's, that is my focus, singular focus, modernization of people and tools and our processes in 2018. Uh, but uh, we are working closely with, with Mark and John Smith and the other areas to uh, do something more than, than, than that if, if possible. Well, are we going to be getting some sort of report? It may not be to this committee, but I think some sort of analysis of how we're getting ready. Because I, I've heard this so many times from people in the business that municipalities seem to, that, that it's such a difficult problem that they prefer to avoid it. Uh, one of the topics that I would like to bring in front of this committee uh, at the next possible opportunity is to, is, is to bring a, a level of readiness of your IT infrastructure when it comes to things uh, like AI or blockchain or, or those types of technologies. Uh, and I think uh, that would be an obvious next step to what you've heard today because the next would be is, okay, how is this going to help us achieve some of the things that we are hearing about in the marketplace? So we will want to go a little bit deeper into that topic next time. No, we already do it with our traffic signals because we're almost world leaders in that, and it's the kind of thing I think that we can also use to show people how technology savvy they are with. All right, thank you. All right, thank you. So on the item, it's a good thing. Good thing it's uh, you have to carry it. So it's, yeah, it's the work plan. So it's carried, and I can't imagine what would happen if we didn't carry it. <laughs> so. Uh, in camera items, there are none. Notices of motion for consideration at subsequent meetings, none. Inquiries, none. Other business, none. Okay, we're adjourned. <laughs>